Lord, we just thank you. I, I thank you for everyone here. I thank you for those joining us online. Lord, uh, we're here because you are important to us, and one of the most important things you have given us is your word. And we ask, Lord, as we come before you this morning, bless this time in your word. We just invite the Holy Spirit to come, to breathe upon this, to make it real in our hearts and minds, and to change our lives. And Father, we just thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to start today. We're actually in Moses part three, but I'm going to begin by reading out of the book of Hebrews some scriptures about Moses. And Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 through 27, where the scripture says this, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. And that's how we have come to be looking at the life of Moses because we've been looking at examples in the Bible of people who were pure in heart and saw God. So we've been considering Moses in that. He saw what no one else saw. Everyone else saw the army of Pharaoh and the power of Pharaoh. Moses saw him who is unseen and he who is unseen gave Moses the courage the second time around as he tries to deliver Israel to walk boldly into the very throne room of Pharaoh and demand right into his face that Pharaoh let the people of Israel go. How did he do that? How did he leave? Well, he endured. And that word endured is an important word. If you believe that your Christianity is not going to require endurance, you're sadly mistaken. You're going to need endurance as a character trait in your life to survive the ups and downs and the bounces, the attacks of the enemy, the, the joys that come in waves as well. Endurance is so important. Endurance is that uh, energizer bunny that just doesn't stop. You know, it just keeps going against the odds. That's endurance. How did Moses endure? He endured as seeing him who is unseen. And uh, today we're going to come now to the passage on the burning bush, and that is found in Exodus chapter 3, uh, beginning with uh, verse 1. So we're going to be beginning here with verse 1 where the scripture tells us this. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So Moses now, he's 80 years old. And he went from having everything in terms of possessions, power, all those things as Pharaoh's son. He went from that to now at 40, he's, he has to run away because he handled things wrong and he fled for his life from Pharaoh. Well, now 40 years later, he's 80. And if you were to ask him, well, how have things gone the last 40 years, Moses? He would say, well, I'm still living with my in-laws and I'm taking care of their sheep. <laughs> it hasn't gone great over the last 40 years. He, he doesn't have his own flock. 
he, he's taking care of like the family. He's serving the family that he's now a part of. Nothing wrong with that. But he's gone from sort of like the heir of everything to the heir of almost nothing. And that has been a 40-year period of time. Uh, in addition, his upbringing in Egypt, uh, th this was even more humbling because we know from the story of Joseph in Genesis chapter 46, 34, every shepherd is loathsome to the Egyptians, it says. So he's gone from the house of Pharaoh privileged son adopted into that family to a loathsome position in the eyes of those from whom he had to flee. So it's just kind of interesting. This shows how lowly and uh, in the eyes of the world at least, you know, this drastic change from prince to shepherd is uh, moving from a powerful figure to an unknown a humble, dependent servant. And he's impoverished for 40 years. He was wealthy beyond reason for 40 years. And now he's impoverished for 40 years. He's uh, sharply contrasted with his former self-sufficiency and his privilege. But he's connected to Jethro, the priest of Midian, his father-in-law is identified as the priest of Midian. Midianites were also descendants of Abraham through his wife Keturah, and they practiced a form of religion that wasn't exactly accurate, but it did have reference to Yahweh, to Jehovah. They did, even though he wasn't called that yet, the God of Abraham, they did understand something about the God of Abraham. So, it tells us he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness. It's often translated as the backside of the wilderness. You know, there, there's not much there. And uh, he's trying to take these sheep that aren't even his own and to lead them to pasture. But Moses finds himself fully isolated in a very desolate region. He's away from the distractions of society. And, you know, uh, he can't get Wi-Fi out there. So, you know, he's not checking the penguin score. He's just out there. And there's not much for him to do. There's not much for him to think about. He's away from the distractions of society. And, do you know, there are times in our lives where God wants to just kind of separate us from the, the daily pressure of life to get us alone with him so that he can speak to us. And that's where Moses found himself. He's in this remote environment. There's not a lot to distract him. He doesn't know it, but God's preparing him for a life-altering divine encounter with himself. Moses doesn't know that. He's just like, this is my life. I went from being a powerful general in Egypt to taking care of a few sheep that don't even belong to me. Out in the desert, I'm 80 years old, and this is what it's going to be. But you know, God had other plans. And in that place, he's in a wilderness, and wilderness in the Bible is often associated with testing, transformation, and revelation. If you find yourself in a wilderness, you might not be in a bad place. You might just be in the place you need to be to hear something fresh from God for your life because you're not having all the distractions taking place of life as it might be and often is. So there's this symbolism. Um, he's also getting to know the desert over these 40 years because soon he's not gonna be leading a few sheep that don't belong to him. He's gonna be leading a nation of over a million people through a desert and he's gonna be leading them for the next 40 years of his life 
through a desert. So it's a good thing he became acquainted with the desert. And God had purposes in all of that. So he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness. You know, Moses' steps, he couldn't see it, but his steps were being orchestrated by God, and he didn't know it. And sometimes in our lives, when we end up in circumstances and situations where we just feel like it's a complete wilderness. You know, we don't know it, but God's orchestrating our steps because he's got something he's going to do in our lives in that wilderness place. We think, I guess this is it. God thinks they're almost ready. We think my best days are behind me. God says, you don't even know how good it is what's going to come. That's the place of the wilderness. It's lonely. It, we, we think back to what was and wish we had it sometimes. Like, he, you know. But he was right where God needed him to be. And at the time God needed him to be, you know, when he was 40 and he tried to, to foment this rebellion, he was strong. Now he's 80. He's not that strong. I, uh, I'm 71 as of last Friday. And when I push the wheelchair through the hospital, I feel it right here. <laughs> 40 years ago, I didn't. <laughs> so, you know, here's Moses. He's gone from this confident, I got this, I can do this, I'm the one, everyone knows it's me. He's gone to frail, not so dependent upon himself. Matt, you got it coming. You don't have to, you know, enjoy your strength and your youth, you know. But days will come, you'll feel it a little more. Moses was in that time. And it says he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Moreb is a place where God will later make a covenant with all of, of Israel. And it's often called Mount Sinai. And Moses' steps were not coincidental. I mean, he might have thought, I'm just leading this little flock of my father-in-laws. But he finds himself at the base of the mountain that is going to be so significant for the rest of the scriptures. He doesn't know that. It's not significant yet. It's just a wilderness at this point. But he finds himself right there, and his steps are being orchestrated by God, and he didn't even know it. You know, I, I think that we need to give God more credit in our lives for the way that he places us and the way that he leads us and the way that he guides us. We think we're just ambling through life. And, oh, I guess I might as well take this little flock of my father-in-laws this way. And God says, I have led you here. I have directed your steps. I have you here for a reason and a purpose. Moses wouldn't have thought there was any reason or any purpose at that point. But his steps were being encountered, orchestrated by God, and he didn't even know it. Let's take a look at verse 2, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 2. So there he is. He's at Mount Horeb. He's out in the middle of nowhere, the backside of the desert. Verse 2, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, and yet the bush was not consumed. Well, this, the term for what happens here is called a theophany, God appearing to someone in a, a visible manifestation. Theophanies happen at different times throughout the Bible. A theophany is a visible manifestation of God often taking on a temporary form to reveal himself to people. So he reveals himself to Moses in this bush. This bush is burning, but it's not being consumed, and he knows that this is not normal. A theophany is not God's permanent, invisible nature, but it's a tangible expression that people in the Scripture could sometimes experience him directly through. 
and the burning bush in Exodus 3 is a classic example of this. There are lots of others, God appearing as a pillar of cloud and fire in the wilderness and on Mount Sinai where he appears as thunder, lightning, and a cloud. But fire, fire represents God's purity and holiness. We spent quite a few weeks talking about how God purifies and and fire uh, uh, is at work in us to remove the dross in our life. God allows the fire to come to us. Well, fire is a representation of God's purity and holiness. And this bush had this blazing fire within it, but it was not consumed. And some people see a picture in this of Israel, a metaphor for their affliction in Egypt. And the bush represents Israel, and the fire represents the sufferings that they undergo. But despite these intense sufferings, they're not destroyed, just as the bush was not destroyed. This example illustrates God's faithfulness and his preservation of Israel through all of their sufferings. It's a powerful reassurance to Moses that God is present with his people even in their trials. Fire is a symbol of God's presence and guidance. It's similar to the pillar of fire that later leads them through the wilderness shows that God can dwell in human affairs without being limited by the natural world. And isn't that amazing? We we often think God is just limited to the natural world. But when he appears to Moses in this fire, in this bush, it's very obvious this is something that supersedes the natural world. My guitar over here, I don't know if you can see it where I have it down on the floor there. When Charlene and I went to Scotland, I couldn't take a guitar because we didn't have enough luggage space. And we got to Scotland and uh, both times God provided a guitar for me. Both times we went to Scotland. But on this occasion, we were sitting in a Christian service and a gentleman was playing that guitar up on the platform and I was wanting a guitar because it's a, I'm not good like Eddie and Robbie but it's still a good part of my life, you know, it's a big part of my life and I really wanted a guitar to worship with. And we're sitting in this service and and the whole, you know, in the natural I couldn't buy a guitar. You know, YWAM stands for youth without any money, right? So in the natural, I couldn't buy a guitar. So I'm sitting there, and this gentleman was playing the guitar, and I heard the Holy Spirit speak to my heart, and he said, I'm going to give you that guitar. There it is. I didn't say a word to anybody after the service, immediately, immediately after the service, he walked from the platform, handed me that guitar, and said, God spoke to me and told me to give you this guitar. See, we limit God to the natural, but the burning bush shows you can't limit God to the natural. He's above and beyond. And I played that all over England all over Scotland, wherever we went, played that in worship, played it in the open air, sang at bus stops. It was okay until the bus came and took your crowd away. (laughs) I played it in this little park. You know, I just wanted to get alone and worship God. There was a park across the street from where we lived. I found this little enclosed area and no one was around. I sat down with that guitar and just began to worship closed my eyes. Half hour later, I opened my eyes. I had a whole crowd of people in front of me. I didn't even know they were there. That's the guitar. And the burning bush, the fire not consuming it, is in amidst other things. It's God saying he's not limited by the natural world. And he can guide through every challenge. 
The burning bush is also an image of calling and commissioning. God's igniting something in him. God's igniting something that's going to change the course of human history in Moses. He's igniting something. And you know, when we're in the presence of God, there just may come a day where he just ignites something in you that you thought was long past in your life. But he's not limited to age, to time. He can overcome mistakes as he overcame Moses' mistakes. And his purposes have a a holy fire about them. So you've got this image of God's calling and commissioning and just like the bush holds the fire without being destroyed Moses is going to be filled with the fire of God's presence and power without being overly consumed by it God's call often comes with a divine power that enables and sustains the person no matter what the challenges are so these are four different ways of looking at some of the symbolism of the burning bush. Moses sees this burning bush. And this was um, a, a, a thorn bush. And many Bible scholars believe that the bush that burned in the, in the wilderness was the acacia bush or the thorn bush of the desert. Genesis chapter 3, verse 18, God had said, when mankind sinned, thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field in your sweat. So thorns and thistles become an emblem of the cursed earth because of people's sin. And this bush, if it was acacia, whatever bush it was, if it wasn't, it had thorns. God's holy fire is coming into the very emblem of sin to show that he's going to deliver Israel out of their bondage. So it's traditionally believed to be an acacia bush, which was a type of shrub commonly found in that area. They're resilient, thorny desert plants known for their toughness and ability to thrive in bad conditions. That's just a a depiction of the size of an acacia bush next to, it's not actually a picture of Moses, (laughs) but, you know, it's supposed to represent Moses anyway. But it shows you, you know, this was not a bush that was like a tumbleweed size. It was a fairly substantial bush. And... You can see, uh, uh, you know, contrasting the size Moses might have been. And this acacia bush adds a lot of symbolic depth to the burning bush encounter. It, It talks about survival in harsh conditions. It symbolizes resilience and survival in hospitable, in inhospitable environments. It underscores God's power to preserve his people in the face of suffering and adversity. Sometimes when you're in a hard time and it's been a lengthy hard time and you have the joy of the Lord in your life, the enemy just can't figure it out. I thought I had him, the devil says. (laughs) Oh no, oh no. We're acacia plants. We thrive in the desert by the grace of God. He's built us for that. He's built us to face adversity and challenge and to find the resources in him to thrive no matter what the circumstances are in our lives. You know, the acacia thorny bush, there are other thorny bushes, but the bushes in in that time were thorn, whether it was acacia or not. But acacia is also connected to the tabernacle and the sacred furniture in the tabernacle. Acacia wood was used extensively in the construction of the tabernacle and its furnishing, such as the Ark of the Covenant was made from wood from this, well, not this very plant, but 
a plant very similar to this that the Ark of the Covenant was crafted from. And uh, the altar of sacrifice was crafted from wood from the acacia tree. So was the table of showbread. It's it used extensively, and it's sort of, to me, like a prefiguring of, okay, the thorn plant is the representation of the sin of mankind. You'll earn your bread in the sweat of your brow because the earth is going to produce thorns and thistles because of your sin. That emblem now, God touches with his fire as he comes to Moses. I'm going to purify you. I'm going to purify mankind. I'm going to purify the root, the source of sin. And then that same wood is taken into the tabernacle. And when Israel is offering sacrifices for their sins upon that altar, it's that wood of the plant that represents what God had cursed now representing an atonement, now representing God redeeming the curse. And then there's even another connection. Most people believe that the crown of thorns that Jesus wore was an acacia plant crown. And that's what those thorns look like so God's he says I'm coming in my fire to that which I have cursed and that which I have cursed is going to provide the furniture for the burnt offerings that are going to picture my son giving his life to forgive the world and then as Jesus is on, is getting ready to go to the cross, a crown of thorns is placed upon his head. Yeah, look at those thorns. P people took a club and beat them into his head. I wouldn't even want it sitting on my head, let alone clubbed into my head. Matthew 27 29, after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. And the thorns from the burning bush, the acacia wood in the tabernacle, in the altar, the Ark of the Covenant. Jesus, crowned with these same type of thorns, takes the curse on himself and he transformed these symbols of man's sinfulness into emblems of God's grace and forgiveness. So, as in the burning bush, it was not consumed. Jesus endured suffering, turning shame into redemption. It's sort of a link through a lot of the Old Testament, beginning here with these thorns, this thorn bush, that God comes to Moses in. From the Ark of the Covenant to the altar of sacrifice to the crown of thorns from the thorn bush. Covered in gold, acacia wood formed the altar where sacrifices were offered to atone for people's sins. This is the ultimate act of love. Christ did that for us to take away the curse that we deserved to forgive us and bring us into his family. The ultimate act of love, transforming the symbol of sin and suffering into one of redemption and victory. So here's Moses. He's, he's, a, he's a shepherd now. He doesn't even own his own flock. He's got his father-in-law's flock. He's a shepherd. He's out there. God reveals himself to Moses in this burning bush, in this glory. You know, it kind of reminds me of 
other shepherds generations later who will not behold a theophany but will behold God incarnate laying in a manger. Moses encounters God on sacred ground in a desert mountain where a lowly bush becomes a a vessel for God's revelation. The shepherds witness the incarnate God in a humble manger and an unexpected and very ordinary place surrounded by animals rather than grandeur. And those shepherds, after the angels lit the sky and the glory of God was seen, then they said, come, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that the Lord has made known to us. They beheld this baby who had no human father. This baby who was God, having taken on our humanity, leaving heaven, never ceasing to be God, but not accessing his privileges of God. Colossians chapter two says, for in him, Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Oh, this wasn't a theophany that they saw. This was the greatest miracle ever. Jesus having taken on our humanity. Hebrews chapter one, verse one. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. He, he, Christ, is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. That's the one they saw as an infant in a manger. You get worried about the world? There's reasons to worry about the world. But do you know what? He has appointed his son heir of all things. And that son upholds all things by the word of his power. So get your eyes back on him. It'll keep you sane in the world we live in today. That much I can tell you. So this is a form of divine revelation that came to Moses, this theophany. And this theme of thorns runs right through it, thorn wood. When I lived in Bethel Park, I used to live on Thornwood Drive. I never thought about that. As a baby, my parents had a home on Thornwood Drive. If I lived there now, it would have a different meaning to me. But I was just a kid. I didn't even have a room. My room was the hallway between my brother and sister's room. They just stuck a little dresser there and let me sleep. (laughs) That has uh, nothing to do with anything. But Exodus chapter three, verse three, says this. Moses now, he sees this bush with this fire burning and the bush is not consumed. So verse three, Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come here. Remove your sandals from your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight. We, we have an artist's rendition of what it must have at least somewhat looked like. So uh, I know that Sam is going to be able to get that up for us. But, but to Moses, it's a, it's a marvelous sight. And there's significance in this. It was a picture of God, for it revealed his glory and his power, yet it was not consumed. Moses was about to undertake 
an incredible task. And he would have to be rooted in the reality of who God was for him to find the courage to do what God wanted him to do. And it kind of also illustrates Moses. He's now a humble shepherd, but with God's divine enablement, he'd become a fire that couldn't be put out. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire in the midst of a bush. He looked, and the bush was burning with fire, yet not consumed. It was holy ground. God said to him, do not come near. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place in which you're standing is holy. It's an everlasting flame. Do you know, it's an amazing thing that God's purposes are are revealed from generation to generation. Right downstairs in our cafetorium that we have downstairs, there's a next generation that's learning to be filled with the fire of God. You know, they're, they're gonna take this fire. God's fire is indistinguishable. When Rome tried to destroy Christianity, it just fed the fires of revival. I mean, who would think? It can't be destroyed. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that we are part of a, of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Aren't you happy about that? In the book of Hebrews, it tells us that the day will come when everything that can be shaken will be shaken. We might be in that day or pretty close to it right now. But that's not the whole picture for those who belong to Jesus Christ. We're part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And we have a king. Isn't that wonderful? King Jesus. And whatever else happens in the world, we're part of something that can't be shaken. And this flame, this fire that consumes, it's in, in, it cannot be extinguished. And the Bible tells us that he drew near. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the trial. Moses turned aside. Yeah. Have you turned aside? Yeah. Have you stopped living your life for yourself, for the things you want? H have you had a, a, a revelation of the person of God that makes you want to say, God, I don't want to live for those things anymore. They might not be bad, but I want to live for you. Have you turned aside? Have you given your life to him? Or you, you know, just imagine Moses seeing this burning bush and knowing it's the presence of God saying, uh, my sheep are more important. Choose someone else. It'd be crazy, wouldn't it? Have you turned aside? Like Moses, we're called to turn aside and see God's love revealed. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses had called his son Gershom, meaning stranger, I don't fit. God calls to Moses, Moses, Moses. Do you know what Moses may have heard, you know, when, when people call me Daniel, when my wife calls me Daniel, I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> but when other people call me Daniel, I hear God is my judge. God is my judge because that's what my name means. And I've tried to live in light of that to the best of my ability throughout my life, that God is my judge. When Moses heard Moses, Moses, 
He's going back 80 years. He's hearing, you were drawn out. You were drawn out. There's something God had for you. There's a reason he drew you out. Moses, it might look impossible to you right now, but I drew you out. You were drawn out. And that's what he's hearing. He's hearing drawn, drawn out, drawn out. You know, he's given up. He's saying, I guess I just don't fit anywhere. I'm going to call my son Gershon. And God comes to him a little later and he says, Moses, there's a reason you were drawn out. There's a reason that your name is Moses. It, it reawakened something in Moses. There's a reason he was drawn out. His life was not random. There, there's a reason things went the way they did. And I think we need to be more appreciative of that in our lives. There's a reason things go the way they go. We may not like the way they go. We may wish they'd have gone a different way. We may have contributed to the way they went if it was not what we hoped for. But there's a reason things happen. And his life was not random. God's purpose was infused in his personal history. And now... There's an inextinguishable purpose that's going to be ignited. When he was 40 years old, he flared out. <laughs> he tried it his way. Didn't work out too good. Now he's 80. God's saying, I'm going to give you my flame. I'm going to give you my flame. I am reigniting the flame of purpose in you. But this time it's a fire that I will sustain and not one that will burn out because it's human effort. You know, God was assuring him that his previous failure would not define his future. Isn't that wonderful? So he's hearing, drawn out, drawn out. That flame that once burned too hot and too quickly in Moses' heart is being transformed into a divine fire and one that would endure the trials and the obstacles. When God's fire touches us, things change. You know, Peter on the day of Pentecost had a huge regret. His huge regret was that he had denied Christ three times. But on the day of Pentecost, God's fire touched him. And he was no longer defined by his denial of Christ. He stood up and preached and 3,000 people came to the Lord. Us with the Holy Spirit is better than us without the Holy Spirit. I've done both, and you probably have too. Us with the Holy Spirit is definitely an improvement on us without the Holy Spirit. And here's this Moses. Now, he's 80 years old. He doesn't own anything. He's taking care of someone else's flock in the desert. He'd had this meteoric fall from position, wealth, power to nothing, not even owning his own sheep. And now he's 80 and God comes to him and he says, drawn out. You were drawn out for a reason. I don't know, it just seems like often God waits until we've given up on ourselves for him to really work and move in the ways that we know he's capable of moving. And that was certainly true. And Moses says to him, here I am. Have you said that to God? Here I am. You know, God's calling your name. Have you said to him, here I am, or have you said, uh... 
static. <laughs> or if you said, that must be the devil. <laughs> God's calling your name saying, sacrifice. Oh, that can't be God. Hear them. <laughs> Here are they, God. Sacrifice? I don't want to sacrifice. Here are they. Yet whatever God asks of you is the best thing you could possibly do in your life. Well, would God call me to sacrifice? Well, just ask any of the 12 apostles who were all martyred for their faith. He will call you to sacrifice. Anything worth having is worth sacrificing for. If you have something in your life that's not worth sacrificing for, it really doesn't mean much to you. You have to sacrifice for things that are important. And Moses, he hears God calling his name, reigniting this, there's a reason I was born. I was drawn out. And he says to God, here I am. Wow. He could say in all honesty, I don't have much, but here I am. I don't have a business to give you a lot of money, God, but here I am. I don't have clout. I don't have power, but here I am. And sometimes, you know, it's when we are the most aware of our limitations that we become the most conscious of God working and moving in our life. Moses says, here I am. Do you know this fire had a precedent? Maybe some of you know what precedent I'm talking about. The precedent was the covenant with Abraham or Abram at the time. In the covenant God made with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13 and 14, it says this, God said to Abraham, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve and afterward they will come out with many possessions. Verse 15, and for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. And it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, this mobile fire that didn't need a source of fuel in the natural world, when this fire, this presence of God revealed in this way, this theophany was revealed to Abraham, God said to Abraham, your descendants are going to be enslaved for 400 years. And at the end of 400 years, they're going to return. They're going to return when the iniquity of the Amorites is complete and I'm making a covenant with you. And instead of a person walking through the pieces of the animals in the blood covenant, there's this theophany, this fire of God moving through this covenant. And now the 400 years are almost completely finished. And God reveals himself again in this fire that needs no natural source of fuel a theophany, but now it's to Moses. And he's saying, Moses, 
I drew you out, drawn out, drawn out. Don't you know that even 400 years ago, this time I spoke about, and I spoke about it in the theophany as a fire, and now I've returned to you in this theophany as a fire, and I'm embedding myself in what, resent, what represents sin, and I'm calling you You're going to bring those people out of Egypt. You're going to do exactly what I told to Abraham 400 years ago. They're going to come out, and it's going to be you. And Moses is like, uh, I tried that. <laughs> it didn't work out too good. I'm going to breathe a fire in you, put a purpose in you. You know, every one of us have a purpose. There's a reason God created us. Maybe we've lost track of that reason. Maybe we haven't. But usually it's when you're not feeling you can do it that he says, perfect timing. I'm going to put a fire in you. Now, he uses us when we feel like, he can do, like we can do it too. But there are some times when we just don't think we can do it. And he comes and he says, and, and you could put this in a different scripture is certainly very appropriate here. Not by might. Not by human power but by my spirit, says the Lord. The Bible tells us that God made his ways known to Moses and his acts known to the children of Israel. He made his ways known to Moses. Moses learned dependency. Moses learned holiness. Moses learned to respond. When God said, Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. And it wasn't easy. But boy, was it meaningful. And I'm going to ask Ed to come back up. Next week, we're going to look at Moses' five excuses as to why he couldn't do this. But you know, with all of his excuses, he ended up doing it. You ever make excuses? I have. Well, we may have our excuses, but God can still have his way. And you know, today as we prepare to receive communion together, we can invite our singers back up as well and Ravi in the wings over there. The way we're going to take communion today is Janet and Bruce are going to come and they'll have the elements up here and some small waste baskets for people to come. And just beginning from the back, once we're ready, if you could come and receive communion uh, up here and then, you know, as space fills up, continue for others to come. But I want you to just think about that question. Have you turned aside? You know, have, has God's priorities for your life changed the direction of your life? Or are you casually interested? If you're casually interested, you're going to miss out on a whole lot. Have you turned aside? Said, I'm going this way in my life. Yeah, thank you for the other things in my life, God, but I I'm going this way. I'm turning aside. I'm going to pursue you. And when God called Moses, 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 Moses didn't say, wait a few years. He didn't say, I'm not ready. Well, he kind of did say that. But at that point, he didn't say that. 
He said, here I am. You know, I was uh, probably 16 when I said, here I am. And I never would have dreamed when I said, here I am, and I gave my life to Jesus. I, I never would have dreamed how rewarding my relationship with God would be. I never would have dreamed. I never would have dreamed that he would be an anchor to my life through all kinds of problems and struggles and hardships. I'd have never dreamed. I'm so thankful that I made that decision when I was 16 years old. Here I am. You know, he called my name, Daniel, Daniel. God, I'm your judge, I'm your judge. I've tried to live my life in light of that. You know, I've never had a Moses mega church. You know, Moses had a church of a million and they sure complained a lot. <laughs> but by his grace, we've been able to serve him in three different countries. And Got to meet some wonderful people along the way. I don't consider myself a big deal that God should have gone out of his way to send the Holy Spirit to call me. But that's why he's God, that's why I'm not. His purpose for you is unique to you. And, and you know, usually it, it just seems like he waits till it looks like there's no hope. You've given up. It can't happen. It won't happen. It's been this way too long. And he just says, I'm going to set a fire in you. How many of you know what I'm talking about? So these elements of communion, Janet, Bruce, if you wouldn't mind coming up to the front. If you have asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, we encourage you to come and to take part in these elements. They represent His sacrifice for our sins. They represent His forgiveness. And that's where it begins. You know, have you asked the Lord to forgive you? Have you, have you said, here I am? And we're just going to have a prayer while we get this set up. I'd like for you to pray along with me if, if you haven't before. Dear God, I want to thank you that you know my name. You've directed my life in the way it's gone for a reason. And I'm here this morning, Lord, to turn aside to you. I don't want to just be casually interested. I, I want to pursue you. And I tell you, Lord, because of the blood that Jesus shed, because of the victory he won, because of what these elements represent, I have total confidence in giving my life to you. And I do this morning, Jesus, for Forgive me of my sins. I give my life to you. Help me to get to know you better. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.